In this A-level IB chemistry video, we're going to be talking through another mechanism. And the third mechanism, which I'm going into today, is elimination. Now, as the name suggests, within this type of mechanism, we'll see that something is removed from the starting molecule. Now, in terms of a starting molecule, what we need to begin with is a halo alkane. And through elimination, what we'll end up with is an alkene. And remember that alkenes are unsaturated, which means they contain a carbon-carbon double bond. So really, you can hopefully see what is it that we'll actually be eliminating here. Well, we're going to be eliminating a halogen because we're going from a halo alkane to an alkene. What's also involved in a reaction tends to be the hydroxide ion. Crucially, remember that it has a lone pair. And hopefully, if you've looked at my nucleophilic substitution video, you'll see there's quite a few similarities. We're starting with a haloalkane. Hydroxide may be involved. But what is the crucial difference? Why are we carrying out an elimination reaction here rather than a nucleophilic substitution? Well, that's all to do with this hydroxide ion. In nucleophilic substitution, remember, it was acting as a nucleophile. In elimination, it's acting as a base. It's really important that you remember what a base is. A base is a proton, otherwise known as a hydrogen ion acceptor. So through the course of this reaction, our hydroxide ion will accept H+. And that's really what makes this reaction so different. But my question to you now is, how do you force a reaction to be elimination rather than nucleophilic substitution? Well, that's all to do with the reaction conditions. In an elimination reaction, you need high temperature, and you also look out for this as a clue in the exam question wording. You need ethanol acting as a solvent. So let's just look at a little example. So we need a source of hydroxide ions, something like potassium hydroxide. Now notice when it has a Q written after it, aqueous, that means it contains water. That is not the situation we're after here. We need ethanol acting as a solvent in this case. So instead the wording would be something like potassium hydroxide was dissolved in ethanol. So that's what we're after in order to force an elimination reaction to occur. So let's look at our first example. We're going to take one bromopropane. So there's the all important haloalkane and we're going to react it with the hydroxide ion. So let's start by drawing one bromopropane. Remember because it's propane it has three carbon atoms because it says the number one, that tells us where the bromine attaches onto the first carbon. So next up, we need to introduce our hydroxide ion. So the first step of this mechanism is that the lone pair on the hydroxide ion attacks a hydrogen atom. Now notice that the hydrogen, it's not any old hydrogen atom. After all, there's lots to pick from, from this molecule. It attacks the hydrogen atom on the carbon next to the carbon with the bromine attached. So really, here or here doesn't make any difference but notice that it attacks a hydrogen on a carbon next to the carbon containing that bromine atom as always we need to use curly arrows here so we're going to show that lone pair attacking this hydrogen atom notice that the electrons in the hydrogen carbon bond move to here in the second step and that really introduces a double bond between those two carbon atoms and that newly formed double bond actually repels the electrons in the carbon-bromine bond, meaning that you see a movement here. Don't worry too much about understanding it, just notice exactly where I'm drawing these arrows, you have to be incredibly accurate about it. And because those electrons have moved to bromine, it can now be eliminated as a negative halide ion. So let's look at our product. Because we've lost that bromine and we formed a double bond, this is our new structure, Notice that each carbon forms four bonds, each hydrogen atom, as always, forms one bond. What's this called? Well, because we have three carbons in a row, and it's an alkene, it's propene. Now, because that hydroxide ion has acted as a base, we know that it's accepted the hydrogen ion. Well, what's going to form? Water forms. Remember that that hydroxide ion will have come from something like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So we've already acknowledged the OH 
So what's left over? Well, the group 1 metals, because we had a compound containing bromine, will form sodium bromide or potassium bromide. So I'm really interested in these products here. There's the organic product. We know that water forms and we know that uh, sodium bromide or potassium bromide will form based on what the original hydroxide ion containing molecule was. Just to show you an example as a chemical symbol equation, here's our haloalkane example. We're going to add sodium hydroxide to it. Due to the high temperatures, the fact that we have ethanol acting as a solvent, elimination is going to take place. So we'll lose that bromine atom and we'll produce water and sodium bromide. Let's do a second example now. So elimination reaction involving 2-bromobutane and potassium hydroxide. So butane means it contains four carbon atoms. The two tells us that the bromine is attached on the second carbon. Now, crucially, I told you that this hydroxide is going to attack on a hydrogen attached to a carbon, which is next door to the carbon containing the bromine. So really, by definition, that means it could attack here or here. By the way, it could attack here or here as well, but they're the same. It's just because they're on the other side of the carbon. So we'll ignore those. What I'm really asking, though, is which of these two hydrogen atoms will this lone pair attack at? And the, the answer here is actually both. So I'm going to show you both mechanisms now. So as before, that lone pair attacks the hydrogen, causing this cascade of electron movement meaning that that bromine atom there pings off. So what are we left with? Well, a double bond forms here. And then just make sure you complete the molecule. So what's that called? Well, we have four carbons in a row. Notice that the double bond occurs on the first carbon, so it's actually butbonine, because that one indicates where the double bond is. Let's now look at the second scenario. So we're again drawing out two bromobutane. That Br occurs on the second carbon. Again, we have our hydroxide ion. In this scenario, the lone pair attacks this hydrogen, causing this cascade of electron movement. So if we look at the product form this time, the double bond has shifted position. It's now forming between the second and third carbon atoms. So in terms of its name, it's but2-ene. And remember, as byproducts, we're going to form water and potassium bromide. However, that is not the end of the story. There are actually three organics, so three carbon-containing products. We've listed the first two, butuanine and butuene. But just to show you something, butuene, remember, can be drawn like this. This is still butuene. But it can also be drawn like this. Notice that the CH3 groups can either be on the same side of the double bond or on opposite sides. So although they're both butuene, we say that this is the cis isomer and this is the trans. And if you're feeling fancy, you could call them the Z isomer or the E isomer if you're looking at really high level chemistry. And I was reading up, how do you remember which way round it is? Z stands for the same side. So notice that the CH3 groups are both on the same side of that carbon carbon double bond. E stands for enemy side, so you'll notice that the CH3 groups are on opposing sides. So that's quite a good way of remembering it. 